Hi there. The other day, this was brought to my attention. A Time Magazine issue all about the USSR from March 1943. Naturally, I was intrigued and wanted to make a video covering it, but quickly I noticed a US media pattern that continues to this day. That being the way the American and most Western media report on those currently favorable to their interests. We'll take a look at it in just a second. To refresh our minds, there is no such thing as complete press freedom. The press, like anything else, is a weapon wielded by one class against the other. We currently live in a dictatorship of capital, in which all major media is in giant private conglomerates. As a result, popular media is what they, as representatives of the ruling class, want us to see, usually pro-capitalist and pro-American foreign policy. To quote Lenin, all over the world, wherever there are capitalists, freedom of the press means freedom to buy up newspapers, to buy writers, to bribe, buy, and fake public opinion for the benefits of the bourgeoisie. Let's see this in action, shall we? The greatest purveyor of quote-unquote respectable news in the world is by far the United States. In 1996, the Telecommunications Act was passed, after much lobbying and political bribery, which gave greater control to the aforementioned conglomerates and allowed them to own more and more media under a single entity. Since then, all major media in the US now belongs to only six giant conglomerates, Time Warner, General Electric, Viacom, Bertelsmann, Walt Disney, and News Corporation down from 23 in 1989. They own the vast majority of print publications, movie studios, labels, radio, and television programming, and that's only within the US. They hold plenty internationally too. 85% of print media belongs to an ever-decreasing handful of owners, likewise with film and music. Large banks and corporations are some of the top stockholders of mainstream media as well, with their representatives sitting on the boards of all major print and broadcast media. As a result, media is regularly censored or prevented from being made public according to the whims of these media bosses, with an investigator from the Commission on Freedom of the Press stating, the owners and managers of the press determine which person, which facts, which version of the facts, and which ideas shall reach the public. The Iraq War was the perfect example of this form of selective and censored reporting. Corporate advertisers too are another powerful group who leave their political imprint on the media. As the former president of CBS, Frank Stanton, stated, Since we are advertiser supported, we must take into account the general objective and desires of advertisers as a whole. So, you may report freely as long as our advertisers approve. Something clearly against the idea of a free and independent press, don't you think? Corporate advertisers might directly cancel advertising accounts and hence prevent a show or report from airing simply because they disagree with its content. An example being the prize-winning Quitney Report, a PBS news show that revealed US backing of death squads and dictators in Central America, amongst other hot issues, which went off the air because it couldn't secure corporate funding, quote-unquote. Faces of war on American atrocities in El Salvador, building bombs about nuclear environmental pollution, cover-up, an expose on the Iran-Contra affair, deadly deception, another documentary on nuclear weapons, Panama deception on the US invasion of Panama, amongst many, many more, all face similar censorship or limitation on how, when, and where they can be viewed. Furthermore, many journalists are fired for writing things contrary to the established stance of that particular news source on a topic, with Francis Serra, David Mitchell, Tom Gutting, and Dan Guthrie being a select few out of many. They commented on things as benign as nuclear power to American government handling of tragedies, and weren't exactly communist by any means. Sometimes, journalists are even penalized for off-duty activities and comments. The San Francisco Chronicle fired a columnist for participating in a demonstration against the US invasion of Iraq. Ashley Banfield, after suggesting in a campus talk that news coverage of the Iraq war was sanitized and Americans weren't getting the whole picture, had her NBC contract cancelled. On the other side, though, media owners contribute to election campaigns, attend political fundraisers and state dinners, are many times personal friends with high-ranking officials, but none of this is seen as violating journalistic standards of neutrality and objectivity. Hilariously enough, the same pattern repeated itself as I was writing this script, with Hassam Salem being sacked from the New York Times for his reporting on Palestine. In America, the more one is in favor for capitalism, American foreign policy, and flagrant vitriol against America's so-called enemies, the more they're awarded with lucrative contracts, promotions, and choice assignments. John Stossel, who I've covered in this video before, is a perfect example of this. A self-declared crusader for free market capitalism, privatization of all public services, and climate denial, he began as a so-called liberal, but realized that didn't bring in the big bucks, so he switched sides, and in came the massive seven-figure primetime TV slots. This is a pattern across all of American media. 
when it comes to any network opinion shows. A study by Media Matters in 2006 revealed that conservative guests outnumber so-called liberal ones by 3 to 1, with leftist radical voices being too scarce to even count. This has since been reproduced. Think about that yourself. When was the last time you've seen or heard a socialist voice on any mainstream media, not even just in the US, but globally? Definitely food for thought. The few times mainstream media decides to stray from established corporate orthodoxy, they do it reluctantly and decades later only as a result of overwhelming public outcry, such as with articles on the harmful effects of the tobacco industry and their corporate efforts at minimizing the damage of smoking, as an example. Back to the video in just a second. Let's hear from today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. For a lot of research that I do for my videos, I end up hitting pages that aren't available in my location. That's frustrating as you can imagine, geo restriction really does suck, but not with Atlas VPN. For those unaware, a virtual private network makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel. This way, it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, and hides your IP address and your online activities. It even allows you to change your location for all your researching needs. Developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers in 2019, Atlas VPN was created to make the internet accessible and secure for everyone. Currently, it has more than 6 million users worldwide and boasts the best VPN deal on the market. Right now, there's even a fantastic Black Friday special. So, what are you waiting for? Go down to the description and click that link, use my code Hakeem and get a 3-year subscription for just $1.70 a month with 6 months extra on top. But that's not all, you get blazing fast speeds for streaming or gaming, unlimited protection for all your devices, and an inbuilt ad and malware blocker. And you'll get to save some extra cash as Atlas VPN will find you the best deals online for everything from your online subscriptions to airlines, hotels, and more. Do us both a favor and get Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.70 per month, plus 6 months extra with a 30-day money back guarantee. It's the best Atlas VPN offer of the year, so be quick and get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below to get this limited time offer. Massive thanks to Atlas VPN for the sponsorship, this is what allows me to pay my editor fairly so the support is highly appreciated. Alright, back to the video. On the Overton window, that being the range of policies and opinions politically acceptable at a given time, Parenti says, conservative commentators repeatedly accuse the media of liberal bias. In fact, most daily newspapers offer an editorial perspective ranging from blandly centrist to ultra-conservative. Over the last 70 years, the Republican presidential candidate received more newspaper endorsements than the Democrat in 16 out of 18 elections. Surveys show that Washington journalists, though more liberal on so-called cultural issues such as abortion and gay rights, are more than twice as likely as the general public to support corporate free trade and far more in favor of trimming Medicare and Social Security. Pink and rainbow washing imperialism is a favorite pastime of liberals, after all. Keep in mind, both Republicans and Democrats serve the same interests, yet this is still a pattern noticeable across the board. No matter what interests are represented, it is always the interest of capital. Funnily enough, many of these public media faces are directly linked to the political establishment themselves. David Gergen served in the Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Clinton administrations, and in between was a ubiquitous face within American media. Pat Buchanan was a staff writer for Nixon and Reagan, while also being a columnist and a host for CNN. Hell, we even did a dedicated episode on our podcast about Tucker Carlson and his state involvement. Hundreds of American journalists are directly linked to American intelligence agencies, with the CIA alone owning more than 240 media operations around the world, including newspapers, magazines, publishing houses, radio and television stations, wire services, and so much more. Nowadays, with the death of television and the growth of internet media, this exact pattern is reproduced from Twitter to garbage ad-filled quote-unquote respectable journals. To quote Parente again, if Cuban, Chinese, or Venezuelan journalists were shown to work for their respective countries' intelligence agencies, and if they were found to be intermittently occupying official positions within the governments, including secret operations, it would be taken as a sure sign that these nations lacked an independent press. But not the freedom-loving United States or their allies, it seems. In American media, war is given either glaring praise, as with Thomas Friedman's famous Give War a Chance, in which he called for bombing Iraq over and over again, and that's a direct quote, and destruction from Afghanistan to Yugoslavia. Or the limpest, most impotent protest, which barely even qualifies as such half the time. Little, if any, positive exposure is given to anti-imperialist struggles or to domestic critics of US interventions. To quote Democracy for the Few, the corporate media, along with NPR and PBS, portrayed the Vietnam War, the US invasion of Grenada and Panama, the destruction of Yugoslavia, and the decade-long bombing attacks and subsequent invasion of Iraq pretty much as the White House and Pentagon wanted, with little attention given to the underlying imperial interests and the devastation wreaked by the US forces. Human rights violations in the DPRK or China are repeated ad nauseum in the media, 
Meanwhile, US support of terrorism in dozens of countries, be they death squads, massacres, mass detentions, or coups, barely receive a mention, if even that. American press actively downplayed and ignored the murder of hundreds of thousands of suspected communist Indonesians by the US supported military dictatorship. They actively ignore or downplay the crimes occurring against Palestinians on their own land every single day. The numerous dictatorships in Turkey, Central America, the Philippines, it doesn't matter. If they're on the American side, they can do no wrong. Or they get the lightest possible admonition, buried behind the scathing denouncements of the all caps current enemy. Reporting a little too brazenly about the horrors of American international and domestic affairs could even get you killed. To quote Parente again, in a series of deeply researched articles in the San Jose Mercury News, reporter Gary Webb exposed the CIA's involvement in the drug traffic between the Contras, that being US supported mercenary troops in Central America, and inner city dealers in the United States. Webb was swiftly subjected to a barrage of counterattacks from Washington Post, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major TV networks, and other keepers of permissible opinion. Eventually, Webb's editor caved into the pressure, making a public self-criticism for having published the series. Webb left the Mercury News, his career in shambles. A subsequent report by the CIA itself largely confirmed his charges. Webb was found murdered in his home with two bullets to the back of the head, ruled of course as suicide, conveniently enough. If your story doesn't get you killed, then it'll definitely be buried like with April Oliver and Jack Smith, who ran a story accusing the US military of using sarin gas, a highly lethal nerve gas, in an operation in Laos in 1970 that killed about 100 people, including two American defectors. Immediately, this report was met with a storm of abuse upon Oliver and Smith, with CNN hastily issuing a retraction and firing the two producers, while completely burying the story in the process. Short of that, a prison sentence. In the US, the government is allowed to issue subpoenas requiring news people to disclose their sources to grand jury investigators, which forces the supposedly independent press to act as an investigative arm for the institutions it's supposed to be a watchdog over. For example, in 1998 alone, more than 3,500 subpoenas were served on members of the news media, with dozens of reporters being jailed or threatened with prison for trying to protect their sources by refusing to hand over materials. In essence, this is government coercion that encourages the press to stay out of quote-unquote dirty business, either by censoring itself or by actively discouraging stepping over the line. Alright, alright, that's all well and good. But let's get to the good part. Popular media, how does it present itself? We all know how the USSR is portrayed in popular media, that is in an entirely caricatured way, but let's see a rare example to the inverse. This March 1943 issue, with Stalin's beautiful face as the cover, the first thing that'll hit you is the sheer number of ads, goddamn. Looking past that though, you're immediately met with a beautifully positive overview of quote unquote Russian cartoons, which are now termed dystopian Soviet propaganda of course. In between weirdly sexist ads for toothpaste, which chastise a young woman for her breath, only for her to find her perfect husband once she buys the all new Colgate ribbon dental cream. You see this blurb. Stalin's granite face kept breaking into a grin at Miss Burke White's photographic antics. He seemed very tired and drawn, with a whole night's work ahead of him. Hmm. Talking about lend -Lease, they say, lend -Lease is not only a great fact of the war, but a testing ground for American-Russian relations. These two countries seem likely to emerge as the two greatest powers of the post-war era. Without their full and honest cooperation, there can be no stable, peaceful world. Hmm, I wonder who threw a wrench in all that. Regardless, there are some definitely beautiful photographs in this collection. A tidbit, apparently, people from Seattle had themselves a little watch drive, which were donated to Soviet doctors and nurses on the front lines, which I thought was cute. On page 22, they have an entire piece praising the USSR, saying, No nation in history has done so much so fast, but still decry the usual free speech nonsense, uh, at a time with heavy American press censorship too, funnily enough. A neat tidbit about the Soviet-German non-aggression pact is even mentioned, which is something completely forgotten in the modern day. One thing we can count on in the light of the record is that the USSR is realistic. For instance, before Munich, she had been the greatest advocate of collective security, but when she saw that the democracies would not support that policy, she turned completely around and gained time to prepare herself by signing a pact with Hitler. Conceivably, having been forced to play a lone hand at terrible cost in Russian lives, she will find it realistic to go on playing it in the future. The ideological language aside, pick up any high school textbook or popular article on this topic and they paint a completely fictional different story. One of a Nazi-Soviet alliance, the dreaded Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, all blah blah, all that bullshit. Completely forgetting that the USSR was the last country to sign such a pact, after almost every other country in Europe, and after all the so-called democracies, as the article states, refused to join in a collective security agreement with the USSR against Nazi Germany. 
Page 24 speaks of voting in the USSR in the margins, and on several pages afterwards extol the unity of the many ethnicities of the USSR. On page 31, after a few more ads, is a beautiful sight. The father of modern Russia, it says with the tagline, perhaps the greatest man of modern times was Vladimir Ilyich Ilyanov. They say, Lenin was that rarest of men, an absolutely unselfconscious and unselfish man who had a passionate respect for ideas, but even more respect for deeds. He had mastered the trick of complete concentration. He had a fantastic capacity for work and was scrupulous and thorough about the smallest as well as the biggest duties in his life. He spoke English, German and French as well as Russian, and could read Italian, Swedish and Polish. He was a normal, well-balanced man who was dedicated to rescuing 140 million people from a brutal and incompetent tyranny. He did what he set out to do. I couldn't write a more glowing piece myself. Page 33, they plainly mention that the Soviets defeated American forces during the Civil War, with US involvement in the Civil War conveniently scrubbed out of popular history knowledge afterwards. Page 34, they plainly mention Kamenev's involvement in anti-government plots. Page 38 speaks of Stalin's succession and the differing movements within the USSR. Page 40 discusses meritocracy within Soviet leadership, and on 41 discusses how elections in the USSR exist and differ to, for example, the US, by comparing them to American Union elections instead. Page 44 goes further into democracy within the USSR, stating the Constitution of 1936, which makes voting universal, equal, direct, and secret, does not permit formations of political groups other than the party. While many non-communists are elected to government bodies, the party controls most administrative organs, and its loyal members occupy many responsible posts. They speak of the Council of Commissars, the Supreme Soviet, and other institutions, all without vitriol, just mentioning the truth as it should be. Page 46 speaks of the American ambassador to the USSR, Joseph Davies, who wrote a great book, which was turned into a documentary you can watch online, titled Mission to Moscow, which again gives an actually fair and non-caricaturized view of the USSR. Page 64 shows plenty on Soviet industrial achievement, and 66 presents a very mature and balanced perspective on Soviet collectivization of agriculture. Page 69 describes the quality of Soviet industry, calling it a first-class industrial power. Soviet theater, Soviet cinema, Soviet ballet, the effects of Soviet literacy campaigns, the Soviet military effort, and much more is covered in a mature and down-to-earth way which has practically entirely disappeared from public discussion on the USSR aside from the driest specialist work. Most popular media that even graze the topic of former socialisms are such over-the-top nonsense filled with at best half-truths and, far more commonly, outright lies and misconceptions taken as fact that it becomes difficult to educate oneself on these matters without at least a bit of a headache. It's especially telling on American media that, again, outside of very dry specialist work, a balanced view of the USSR could only be written in the middle of a brutal war in which the USSR was temporarily an ally, of course reluctantly from the American side. I haven't even touched on media manipulation today, but this video has gone on long enough. Two books to read for further interest are Parenti's Amazing Inventing Reality and Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. Maybe a dedicated video is in store in the future for that as well, who knows. Let me know if you want that. That's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, it really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you too. Joe Schumacher, C. Manatisto, Nico, Morton Rene Alquist, Ultimate 255, Matt, Alistair Townsend, Axis Flowers, Dur Devil, Dorman, Miguel de Toro, Isaac, Paul Salsa, Indy Slama, Benamar, The Brainless Bolshevik, SXRUP, and Jay Peterson. Thanks for watching.